We're now on the subject of enthusiasm, and I don't know a better time than to talk about enthusiasm than right now, because you seem to have been demonstrating quite a bit of it. <clears throat> first of all, the very first step in creating enthusiasm is based upon a burning desire. In other words, that's the starting of enthusiasm, and you have no trouble, and uh, as a matter of fact, when you learn how to work yourself up into a state of a burning desire, you won't need the rest of the instructions on enthusiasm because you've already got the last word in enthusiasm. When you want something real badly, you make up your mind to get it, uh, you have that burning desire, uh, it steps up your thinking processes, it, uh, it uh, whets your imagination so that your imagination goes to work and works out ways and means of your getting the thing you desire. That enthusiasm uh, uh, gives you a brighter mind, it makes you more alert to opportunities. You see opportunities that you never saw before when your mind is stepped up to that state of enthusiasm to a burning desire for something definite. And next, uh, there is active enthusiasm and passive enthusiasm. The active enthusiasm is uh, more effective. Now, what do I mean by active and passive? I'll give you an illustration of passive enthusiasm. Henry Ford, for instance, was the most uh, lacking in uh, active enthusiasm of, uh, of any man I have ever seen. I never heard him laugh but once in his life. When he, shakes, when he shook hands with you, it was like taking hold of a piece of cold ham. You did all the shaking. He did nothing but stick his hand out and, and take it back when you let loose of it. And in his conversation, there was no magnetism in his voice whatsoever. And uh, there was no evidence of any shape, form, or fashion of his demonstrating active enthusiasm. Now, what kind of enthusiasm did he have? Because he must have had some to have such an outstanding major purpose and to have achieved it so successfully. It was inward. His enthusiasm was placed, uh, transmuted into his imagination and into his power of faith and into his personal initiative. He went ahead on his own initiative. He believed that he could do whatever he wanted to do. He kept himself alert and keen with applied faith through his enthusiasm, his passive enthusiasm, thinking inside of his own mind what it was he was going to do and all the joy he'd get out of doing it. I once asked him, this was after he, long after he had arrived and had his uh, problems whipped, I asked him if, uh, uh, if he ever wanted anything or wanted to do anything he couldn't do. He said, no, not no, and then he qualified himself, not in recent years. He said in the early days, uh, until he learned how to uh, get or to do whatever he wanted to do, he uh, couldn't uh, answer in the affirmative. And I said, well, in, the, um, in other words, Mr. Ford, is there is anything that you need or want or that you can't get? He said, that's right, that's correct. Well, I said, how do you go about, uh, how do you know that's true? And how do you go about uh, making sure that whatever you want to do, you know you're going to do it before you stop? He said, well, for a long time, I've uh, formed the habit of putting my mind on the can-do part of every problem. If I have a problem, there's always something I can do about it. Many things I can't do, but something I can do, and I start where I can do something. And he said, as I use up the can-do part of it, the, the no-can-do simply just vanishes. If I get to the river where I expected to have to have a bridge, I didn't need the bridge because the river was dry. <laughs> I don't know why it is that, uh, that uh, in our educational system or somewhere in our system of teaching or writing, I don't know why it is that before now people haven't been informed that they have the greatest asset in the world, an asset sufficient unto all of their needs, and that asset consists in their, in their privilege of using their own mind and thinking their own thoughts and directing those own thoughts to whatever objective they choose, and yet they don't do it. Why? Why? Tell me why. Too lazy. Too lazy, said someone. That's the idea. They don't know they have it. There has not been the proper system of education. And I want to tell you that wherever this philosophy touches, wherever it begins to touch, you see people blossom out as they never blossomed out before. It makes a difference because they begin to find out that they have a mind, that they can use that mind, and that they can make it do whatever they want it to do. I don't say that they all uh, run in immediately and take possession of their own mind, but they rather kind of sneak in or slip in, a little at a time. But eventually the, the affairs of their lives begin to change, and the reason they change is that they discover this great mind power and start using it. It's not safe to form opinions based upon newspaper reports. 
I see by the papers is a preparatory remark usually brands the speaker as a snap judgment thinker. I see by the papers, or I hear tell, or they say. How often have you heard those terms? They say so, so when I hear anybody start off with that. Mentally, I pull down my earmuffs and don't hear a doggone thing that they say because I know it's not worth hearing. When anybody starts to give me information and identifies the source by saying, I see by the papers, or they say, or I hear tell, <laughs> I, don't, I don't pay any attention to what's said whatsoever. Not, a, not the slightest attention. Not that what they are saying might not be accurate, but then I know that the source is uh, faulty, and therefore the chances are that the statement is faulty also. The scandal mongers and the uh, gossipers are not reliable sources from which to procure facts on any subject whatsoever. Now why is that true? Well, no, they're not reliable and also they're biased. Did you know that when you hear anybody speak in a derogatory way of anybody else, whether you know the person or either one of the persons or not, the very fact that one person speaks in a derogatory way of another person puts you on guard and gives you the responsibility of studying and analyzing very closely everything that's said. Because you know you're listening to a biased person. You know that. Now, isn't that a marvelous thing for a man to make a statement like that? that he, kept, he started in on, the, on his problem or his objective where he could do something. And he said if he, um, if he wanted to turn out a new model, if he wanted to turn out a, increase his production, he immediately put his mind to work on the plan through which he could do that. And he never paid any attention to the obstacles because he knew that his plan was sufficiently strong and definite and backed with the right kind of a faith that the opposition that he might meet with would uh, melt away when he came to it. And he said an astounding thing was that if you took that attitude of putting your mind behind the can-do part of every problem, the no-can-do part takes to its heels and runs. And I'm quoting his words. I could endorse everything that he has said because that's been my experience. My experience has been that if, if you want to do something, you'll work yourself up into a state of white enthusiasm, uh, go, go to work where you stand if it's nothing more than drawing a picture in your mind of the thing you want to do and keep drawing that picture and making it more vivid all the time that uh, in the, insofar as you make use of the tools that are available to you now to move with will other and better tools be put in your hands that's one of the strange things of life but that's the way it works uh, public speakers, teachers can express enthusiasm by control of the voice now, there isn't any doubt about that. One of my students um, was riding down to class with me this evening and paid me a very high compliment. She wanted to know if I had had any voice training or voice culture or anything that sort. I said, no, nothing, not a thing. I said, I had a course in public speaking a long time ago, but I violate everything the teacher ever taught me about it. In other words, I have my own system. And uh, she said, well, you have the most marvelous voice, and I often wondered if it hadn't been, if you hadn't had it carefully trained to impart the enthusiasm or the meaning that you want to impart with it. And I said, no, uh, the answer to that, the answer to this uh, voice that I have it's, uh, is this, that no matter who hears it, or how inexperienced that person may be, or how much of a cynic that person may be, the person knows one thing, that when I say something, I believe what I'm saying. I'm sincere about it. And that's the grandest voice control that I know anything about. It's to express enthusiasm in, in belief, in terms of belief, as the thing that you're saying. You know that the thing that you're saying at the time is the thing that you ought to say and that will do some good for the other fellow and perhaps for you too. I have seen public speakers that march pranks all over the stage and run their fingers through their hair and stick their hands down in their pockets and go through all kinds of personal gestures. Uh, I don't, I, all that does to me is uh, it distracts my attention when the speaker does that. I have trained myself to stand in one position. I never march around over the stage and very seldom I sometimes uh, spread out my hands, but not very often. But the effect that I want to get is first of all with the sincerity of what I'm talking about and then putting my own enthusiasm back, in the, back of it in the tone of my voice. And if you learn to do that, you'll have a marvelous asset. And then the... <clears throat> 
One must feel enthusiasm before being able to express it. I don't see how in the name of heavens anybody could express enthusiasm when his heart was breaking or his, he was in uh, uh, distress or is in trouble of some sort that he couldn't throw off. I did sit in a, in a show once in New York where the star of the show came on and gave a marvelous performance and she discovered about three minutes before she came on for her part that her father had just dropped dead and that uh, you would never know, never know at all. She gave the performance as perfectly as I, I could imagine it could be given. Not the slightest indication in the world that anything had happened. She, she trained herself to, uh, uh, to be an actress once and always, no matter what the circumstances. And if she hadn't trained herself to do that, she wouldn't have been an actress. An actor who can't uh, uh, fall into the, uh, into, the, uh, into the skeleton shape of his character that he's trying to portray and feel uh, like that character ought to feel will not be an actor. He may express the words, <coughs> the lines that are written for him, but he'll never have the right impression on an audience unless he lives the thing he's trying to put across. And they're really great actors in all walks of life. And they're not all on the stage. There are some of them in private life. The great actors in life are all people who can put themselves into the role that you're trying to portray. They feel it, they believe in it, they have confidence in it, and they have no trouble in conveying to the other fellow a spirit of enthusiasm. This uh, enthusiasm is a mighty tonic for all of the uh, negative influences that get into your mind. If you want to burn up a negative influence, just turn on old enthusiasm. I'm telling you, the two can't stay in the same room at the same time. Just can't do it. You start being enthusiasm over, uh, enthusiastic over anything, and I defy you to let uh, these doubting thoughts or these thoughts of fear come into your mind while you are keyed up in the state of enthusiasm. And one should practice the development of enthusiasm in daily conversations and learn to turn it on or off at will. But you start in now immediately to uh, step up the tone of your voice when you're conversing with other people, to uh, put a smile back on your words, uh, inject into it a pleasant tone, a pleasant feeling. Sometimes you can do that by toning your voice down, not talking so loud. Other times you can do it by stepping it up so that they can't fail to hear you and then recognize what you're doing. In other words, uh, learn to inject enthusiasm into your ordinary daily conversations and you have somebody to practice on in every person you come into contact with. Now this, uh, this assignment that I'm giving you about practicing on people that you come in con <coughs> into contact with daily is a marvelous thing if you just stop and, and watch what happens to you when you start doing that. Naturally, you start changing your tone of voice. You'll go out deliberately intending to make the other fellow smile while you're talking to him or her and make that person like you. It'd be no good to put enthusiasm into telling another fellow what you think about him if you don't think something pleasant. <laughs> because the more enthusiastic you are, the less he'll like you. When you start telling um, another person what you think of him for his own good, <laughs> well, <laughs> believe you me, you better be smiling. <laughs> Nobody wants anybody to reprimand him or to overhaul him or to tell him something for his own good because he knows very well that there's a selfish motive in it somewhere along the line, or he thinks so at least. Speech in monotones is always monotonous and boresome. I don't care who it is that's speaking. If, you don't, if you're not able to uh, get variety and color and rise and fall in the inflection in your voice, you're going to be monotonous no matter what you're saying or who, to whom you're saying it. Just suppose that I came out here and talked in the tone that I am now and never changed my tone of voice and even though I said exactly the same thing that I've been saying and didn't color my voice, why, do you think that uh, I would get such a rousing cheer when I come on and what? Huh? No, of course not. Of course not. I can come out here and keep you from going to sleep, how? By rousing you with a question that you weren't prepared for and then letting you answer it. But mostly by getting some enthusiasm into my tone of voice. Raising my voice, letting it back down again, keeping you jumping and guessing as to what I'm going to say next. That's a good way to hold an audience so you won't be like, keep the audience guessing as to what you're going to say next. If you talk in monotones and put no enthusiasm into what you're saying, the, uh, the listener will be a way ahead of you. He knows what you're going to say long before you say it. And whatever it is, he doesn't want to hear it in the first place. Enthusiasm, it's a marvelous thing. And the, the, the beautiful part about enthusiasm is that you can turn it on and off yourself. You don't need to ask anybody about it. Uh, facial expression should also express enthusiasm through the smile properly directed. 
I, I hate to see a person t talking to me at close range uh, with a, a serious expression on his face that never changes that seriousness in the leaves. Even though the topic of conversation is one of, uh, of a serious nature, I like to see the person uh, soften his face with a smile. If you watch Mr. Stone when he's speaking, he stops quite often through his speeches and smiles, and he's got a, he's got a winning smile. It's a marvelous smile. The way he softens up his whole face. He just absolutely disarms anybody that he's talking to, even though he's saying something the other person doesn't want to hear. <laughs> he, can, uh, he, he can disarm the other person by this uh, change of expression on his face. He's a master at that. I'm not a master at it, but I can do it when I want to, believe you me. Uh, because that's a part of self-discipline too, is to be able to look at the other person, let him know by the tone of your voice what you're saying and the way you're saying it and the way you look. That uh, what you say you mean and that you mean it for his benefit. Now, that's one of the things that you can do with enthusiasm. Facial expression. And start now to observe people who express enthusiasm in their conversational relations. Also, people who do not. And uh, get a great lesson in attractiveness of personality. Just start studying people. If you see a person that you particularly like, watch that person and find out what it is about him that, or her that makes you like him or her. And uh, chances are, a thousand to one, that you find out that whatever that person says to you or engages, whatever conversation he engages in, it will be on an enthusiastic basis. And you'll never be bored, no matter how much he talks or what he says, because he makes it so attractive that you'll never get tired of it. From definite habits, uh, form definite habits, by which you will learn to express enthusiasm in your ordinary conversations. Practice before a mirror. Talk to yourself if you can't find anybody that's willing to listen to it and start out with. You'll be surprised how interesting it is when you start talking to yourself and say the things you want to hear. Don't, don't say the things you don't want to hear when you're looking at yourself in the glass. <laughs> you know, I stood before a, mi a mirror for years and years and years, and I told myself that the day would come, I said, look here in Napoleon Hill, you admire Arthur Brisbane's style of writing, that clear clarity, that succinctness, that definiteness, that uh, simplicity of language, you, you admire that. But Napoleon, you're going to not only catch up with Arthur, but you're going to run rings around him. And ladies and gentlemen, I did just that. <laughs> By talking to this fellow and convincing him it could be done. It's not foolish to talk to yourself in the mirror. It's not foolish to talk. That is, if nobody's standing on the... Be sure to close the bathroom door. Don't leave the door open. <laughs> don't leave the door open. And don't talk too loudly if there are people around too close because they'll uh, probably call the, uh, the psycho <laughs> psychiatric ward and want to know if they can't come down and tend to have a relative down there that's gone berserk. <laughs> use discrimination and all these things, but le really and truly you've got a, an overhauling job to do on yourself. We all have, at one time or another at least. You've got to do an overhauling job. <clears throat> I want to attain to a greater degree of proficiency all the time. I, my, my education is never completed. It's wide open all the time. You know, as long as you're green, you continue to grow, but when you get to where you're ripe, well, not, then the next step is to become rotten. <laughs> I don't want to be ripe. I'm not, I'll never be ripe with knowledge. Never learn the last word about anything. I'm always learning, learning from people. I get much more from you than you do from me because I have several hundred to learn from and you only have one. <laughs> you ever thought of that? But I wouldn't get anything from you if I didn't have an open mind if I weren't trying to learn from you all the time. When you express enthusiasm in your daily conversations, observe with profit how others pick up your enthusiasm and reflect it back to you as their own. You can change the attitude of anybody that you want to by simply working yourself up into a state of enthusiasm. It's a contagious thing and they pick it right up and reflect it back to you as their own. All salesmen, all master salesmen understand that art. If they don't understand it, they are not master salesmen. They're not even ordinary salesmen if they don't know how to key up the buyer with their enthusiasm. Now, no matter what you're selling, it uh, works just the same in selling yourself as it does in selling services or commodities or merchandise. You take a good salesman, go into any store and pick out a salesman that knows his business. And I want to tell you right now that you recognize that that salesman is not only showing you merchandise, but along with it, he's giving you a, some information and a tone of voice that uh, impresses you. Most salesmen, you know, in stores are not salesmen at all. They don't have the first, uh, 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 first idea about salesmanship. They, uh, they're, uh, uh, what will we count, uh, call them? They're order takers. 
order takers, not salesmen at all. They don't sell it. I've often heard them say, well, I sold so much today. I heard a newspaper man that, uh, talking to one of the man that delivers the news to him, I was telling how many papers he'd sold that day. Well, he hadn't sold any papers at all. He'd been there, he had them out, and people came along and bought them and laid their money down. He didn't have anything to do with selling them, except putting, there, putting the merchandise where the people could pick it up and buy. But he thought he was a salesman, thought he was a pretty good one. But you see a lot of people who wrap up merchandise and pass it out to you and take your money who think they've made a sale, they haven't made anything of the kind. You've done the buy. But a good salesman, you can't say that about him. You go in to buy a shirt and before you get out of there, he'll sell you some underwear and some socks and some tie and a pair of suspenders. No, he wouldn't sell me any suspenders because I don't wear them. But he'd sell me a nice new belt. One did that just a day or two ago. <laughs> I didn't need a belt, but he did. He, he showed me a nice one, and uh, it just fitted my personality, and I bought it mostly on the personality of the man I was talking about. <laughs> yes, believe you me, I'm not immune to salesmanship either. Well, um, when you meet with any sort of unpleasant circumstance, learn to transmute it into a pleasant feeling by repeating your major purpose with great enthusiasm. In other words, when any kind of an unpleasant circumstance comes across your path, instead of brooding over that or allowing it to take up your time in regret or in frustration or in fear, just start in and switch over to thinking about this marvelous thing that you're going to accomplish down here one, two, or three, or four, or five years from now, or six months, or whatever, whatever it is. Start thinking about the thing that you can put enthusiasm back of and use your enthusiasm for the things you want and not for the things that you've just lost through defeat. You know, there are a lot of people who allow the death in the family, the death of a loved one, to run them distracted. I've known people lose their minds over that. When my father passed away in 1939, of course, I knew he was going to pass away. We knew what his condition was, and we knew it was only a question of time, and I conditioned my mind so that it could not possibly upset me and make the slightest impress on me emotionally. I got a call from my brother one evening down at my estate in Florida, and I had some rather distinguished company there, uh, talking about publishing business, and my the tele the maid came in and said that my brother wanted to speak to me on the telephone. I went out of the room and talked to him for three or four minutes. He told me that our father had passed away and that the funeral would be that coming Friday. And we chatted uh, a little while about other things, and then I thanked him for calling me and went back to my company. Nobody, nobody knew that anything had happened. Not even many members of my family knew until the next day what had happened. There was no. And no expression of uh, sorrow nor anything of that kind. What was the use? I, I couldn't save him. He was dead. Why well, grieve myself to death over something I can't do anything about? You say, that's hard-hearted? No, it's not hard-hearted at all. I knew it was going to happen. I adjusted myself to it so that it could not destroy my confidence nor my, make me afraid. In matters of that kind, now, as serious as that, you have to learn to, uh, to give yourself immunity against uh, being upset emotionally. You know, when you're upset emotionally, you're not quite sane. You don't digest your food. You're not happy. You are not successful. Things go against you when you're in that frame of mind. And I don't want things to go against me. I don't want to be unhealthy. I want to be successful. I want to be healthy. I want things to come my way. And the only way that I can ensure that is to not let anything upset my emotions. I don't think anybody can love any deeper or more often than I have. But if I had unrequited love circumstances, and I've had that circumstance once in life, I could let that upset me very badly, but I didn't. <laughs> Why? Because I have self-control. Because I won't let anything destroy my equilibrium. Nothing at all. I didn't want my father to die, but as long as he was dead, there wasn't anything I could do about it. There was no use of me dying along too, just because he had. And I've seen people do just that. Just uh, go ahead and die because somebody else had died. That's an extreme illustration I'm giving you, but it's certainly one that's needed by everybody. We need to learn to adjust ourselves to the unpleasantness of life without going down under them. And the way to do that is to convert, to uh, divert your attention away from the unpleasant over to something that is pleasant and then put all of the enthusiasm you've got back of that other something. Your life is, in, you're entitled to have complete control of it. <clears throat> and remember from this day forward that your duty to yourself requires that you do something each day to improve your technique for the expression of enthusiasm, no matter what it is. Maybe the, 
I have touched upon some of the things that you can do, but I haven't touched upon all of them. Maybe you, in, in your circumstances, and considering your relations with other people, you know something that you can do. To step up your enthusiasm so as to uh, make you more beneficial to some other person. And I want to tell you something. And this is a very appropriate thing for the closing of this lecture. If you have a mate, and you can work up a relationship with that mate, where the mate compliments you in every place where you're apt to be weak, then you've got a fortune beyond uh, compare, a fortune that you can't estimate, an asset that's beyond comparison with anything else in this world. Because that mastermind relationship between a man and his wife can surmount and go around and master all difficulties that they may come into contact with. They do it by multiplying, joining their mental attitudes and multiplying their enthusiasm, turning it on each other at the places where they are in need of it. And I thank you very much. I've never known of a successful person in the upper brackets of success in any calling that hadn't acquired the great uh, potential powers of concentration upon one thing at a time. You've heard uh, people <coughs> speak of others <coughs> intending it to be derogatory by calling them people with one-track minds. Have you ever heard that term? Yes. Yeah. Well, anytime anybody calls, uh, says, I have a one-track mind, I want to thank him for it. <clears throat> because there are a lot of people that have motor track minds and they try to run on all of them at the same time and don't make a good job on any. I have observed that the outstanding successes are people who have uh, developed high uh, capacity to keep their mind fixed upon one thing at a time. When you have learned to concentrate on one thing at a time, you have learned to key yourself up to where you can see yourself already in possession of the thing that you're concentrating on. Motives, uh, the nine basic motives is the star, are the starting point of all concentration. In other words, you don't concentrate unless you have a motive for doing it. If you want to make a lot of money, for instance, let's say you want to buy an estate, a farm. And uh, you concentrated on money in the upper brackets, you'd be surprised at how that concentration would uh, change your whole habits, attract to you opportunities for making money that you never thought of before. I know that's the way it worked out because some years ago I wanted a thousand acre estate. Of course I didn't know at that time just how much a thousand acres was, but I, I was concentrating on a thousand acres. And it cost approximately $250,000 to get the land that I was looking for, and that was a lot more money than I had at that time. But almost from the very day that I fixed in my mind the size of the estate that I wanted, opportunities began to open up and develop for me to get that money in, in larger blocks and hunks than I'd ever gotten it before. The royalties on my books commenced to increase, demand for my lectures commenced to increase, demand for my business counsel commenced to increase. So I had just sold myself on the idea that I had to have the money, I was going to get it, I was going to render service for it. I got the estate, I didn't get a thousand acres, I got six hundred acres. And the man uh, from whom I bought it, when I told him that I wanted a thousand acres, he said, I have 600, by the way, d do you know how much 600 acres are? I said, well, I have a rough idea. He said, would you mind walking around this estate with me? <laughs> well, we, <laughs> we started out right one morning and with a couple of golf sticks. I, we took the golf sticks along to knock the rattlesnakes in the head with. And we started around the outer edge of that and we walked until noon time and uh, we went more than halfway around it, up and down over the Catskill Mountains. Noontime, uh, he says, we're just about halfway around. I said, well, instead of going all the way around, let's just turn and go back. <laughs> I've seen enough. 600 acres is plenty. <laughs> well, I bought the place. And then the Depression came on, 1929, 30, 31. And believe you me, it was tough going. But I had uh, accumulated enough money to buy the place. I wouldn't have had it if I hadn't have concentrated on that idea. Then next, the definiteness of purpose or of an obsessional proportion is the moving spirit back of the motive. Now, it's no, there's no use of having a motive unless you put obsessional desire or obsessional purpose uh, back of it. Now, what's the difference between an ordinary purpose or desire and an obsessional desire? What's the difference? 
That's right, that's very good. That word intensity is a very good one. It's a very fitting word. In other words, uh, to wish for a thing or to hope for a thing doesn't cause anything to happen. But when you put a burning desire or an obsessional desire back of a thing, why, it moves you into action and it attracts you to others and uh, attracts things to you that you need in order to fulfill that desire. And also, the, uh, how do you go about uh, developing an obsessional desire about anything? By thinking about a lot of things, changing from one thing to another? No, no. You, uh, you select one thing, you eat it, you sleep it, you drink it, you breathe it, you talk about it as long as you can find anybody to listen. If you can't find anybody, you talk to yourself. That's right, repetition. Keep on telling your subconscious mind exactly what you want. Make it clear, make it plain, make it definite, and above everything else, let your subconscious mind know that you expect results. And no fooling. An organized endeavor or personal initiative is the self-starter that starts the action on uh, concentration. And then applied faith is the sustaining force that keeps uh, action going. In other words, uh, without that applied faith, when the going gets to be hard, and it will, no matter what you're doing, uh, you'd either slow down or maybe quit. So you can see that you need applied faith to keep uh, your action keyed up to a high degree even when the going is hard and when the results are not uh, coming in as you would like them to come. And by the way, did any of you ever hear of anybody starting out to do anything and achieving an outstanding permanent success right from the start without any opposition? Did you ever hear of anybody like that? No. no. Well, don't look now. <laughs> But I want to tip you, out, tip you off to the fact that nobody ever did that and probably nobody ever will. <laughs> the going is hard always with everyone no matter what you're doing. And you've got a tremendous amount of information back of every one of these lessons that you can concentrate on. But you'll have to concentrate on every one of these lessons when you come to it. Put everything else aside and concentrate on that lesson and uh, add to these notes everything that you can get that's uh, related to this subject. You have to come back to it many times. And when I say you have to concentrate on each lesson, that means that you have to come back to each lesson many, many times. You have to keep thinking about each one. But while you're concentrating on a given lesson, don't let your mind be running over all the other lessons. Stick right straight to that one lesson while you're at it. Then the master mind is the source of allied power necessary to ensure success. Can you imagine anybody concentrating on the attainment of a something of an outstanding nature without uh, making use of the mastermind and the brains and the influence and the education of other people? Did you ever hear of anybody achieving an outstanding success without the cooperation of other people? No. I never have, and I have been around quite a bit in this success field, about as much as the average, maybe more than the average, and I have never found anybody yet in the upper brackets of achievement in any line that didn't always a success very largely to the friendly, harmonious uh, a cooperation of other people, to the use of other people's brains and sometimes other people's money. You know, they do that once in a while, too. So you need the mastermind uh, alliance in your concentration if you're aiming for anything above mediocrity. Of course, you can do your own concentrating on failure. That way, well, you won't need any help on that. <laughs> won't need any mastermind on that, but also you'll have a lot of uh, volunteer help on it. <laughs> And a lot of good company along. Well, I say a lot of company, let's put it that way. If you just aim to fail. But if you're going to succeed, you've got to follow these regulations as I'm laying them down for you. You, just, you can't escape them, you can't neglect any one of them. And then self-discipline is the watchman that keeps action moving in the right direction, even when the going is difficult. And incidentally, there's where you need self-discipline the most, is when uh, you have meet with opposition, or when the uh, conditions and circumstances that you've got to cut through are uh, um, difficult, there's where you need your self-discipline to keep your faith uh, going and keep yourself uh, determined that you're not going to quit just because the going is hard. So you couldn't possibly get along in concentrating without self-discipline. Oh, you could if everything went your way. It'd be no trouble at all. You could concentrate on anything if everything was going your way and you didn't need to meet these difficult circumstances. Then the creative vision or imagination is the architect that fashions practical plans for your action back of your concentrating. 
Before you can concentrate intelligently, you've got to have plans. You've got to have an architect. And that architect is your imagination and the imaginations of your mastermind allies, if you have them. What happens uh, when you start out to do something without a definite or a practical plan? Did you ever hear of anybody who st had a very fine objective or a very fine uh, a purpose, a very fine idea, but uh, it failed because he didn't have the right kind of a plan for putting it over. Do you ever hear of anybody like that? Yes. Have you ever heard of any other kind except that? <laughs> is, is that a common pattern, as a matter of fact, for people who have ideas, but their plans for carrying them out are not good, not sound? And then uh, going the extra mile is the principle that ensures harmonious operation, cooperation from others going the extra mile. You need that in, in the business of uh, concentrating. If you're going to get other people to help you, you've got to do something to put them under obligation. So you've got to give them a motive. Even your mastermind allies that are in your own organization, they won't serve as a mastermind allies without a motive. And what are some of the motives, incidentally, that would get people to join you in a, in a, in a, in a given undertaking? What are some of the motives? What's the most outstanding motive? The desire for financial gain, of course. In all business and professional undertakings, I would say the uh, desire for, for financial gain is the outstanding motive. And if you're going into a business that's, uh, where the main object is to make money, and if you don't allow your mastermind allies or your key men and women or the people who are helping you most, if you don't allow them to get sufficient returns, uh, you're not going to have them very long. They'll be uh, going into business for themselves. They'll be going over to your competitors and whatnot. I was very astounded once to hear Mr. Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie, tell me that he paid uh, Charlie Schwab $75,000 a year salary and some, on some years a bonus in addition to his salary of a million dollars. Did that several years. And to me that was a lot of money then, it's still a lot of money now. Well, I was curious uh, about Mr. Carnegie and I want to know why a man of his great intelligence would pay one man like that a bonus of more than ten times as much as his salary. And I said, Mr. Carnegie, did you have to do that? Well, he said, no, certainly I didn't. I could let go and let him go out and go into competition with me. <laughs> sure, I didn't have to do it. There's quite a bit of meaning back of that statement. In other words, he got a good man there that was very valuable to him and he wanted to keep him. And he knew that the way to keep him was to let him know that he'd make more money with Mr. Carnegie than they would without him. Then the applied golden rule gives uh, one moral guidance to the action on the effect of which one is concentrating. Then accurate thinking saves one from daydreaming and the creation, in the creation of plans. And did you know that the, most of the so-called thinking is nothing in the world but daydreaming or hoping or wishing? That's what it is. There are a lot of people in this world who spend the vast majority of their time daydreaming and hoping and wishing, thinking about things, but never doing, never doing what? Anything else. Never taking any actual, physical or mental, concrete uh, action in carrying out their plans. I had an experience a long time ago when I was lecturing over in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, on this philosophy. After the lecture was over, an elderly man tottered up or waddled up to the stage. He was decrepit and not very strong. And he fished around in his pocket and came out with a great bundle of papers that had dog ears on them. And finally he fished around amongst those papers and he came up with one on yellow paper. He said, uh, Nothing new, Mr. Hill, in what you just said. said, I had those ideas 20 years ago. He said, there they are on paper. I had those ideas. Sure he did. <laughs> Millions of other people had them, too. Failure and defeat and adversity needn't stop you, that there's a benefit in every such experience. Yes. What is that benefit? Tell me. Can you see any benefit in a man going through a depression and losing all of his money right down to the last penny, having to start all over again? Well, if you can't, you uh, take a good look now because you're looking at a man who did just that. And it's one of the greatest blessings that ever came along because I was getting just to, to be a kind of a smarty pants. I, I was making too much money and making it too easily. 
and I had to get taken back a notch. I came out fighting, and uh, I have done more good work since that time than I ever did before, and if, without that experience, I probably would be up there on my estate in the Catskill Mountains instead of down here teaching. Sometimes adversity is a blessing in disguise, and oftentimes not so much disguise as that. If you take the right attitude toward it. Uh, you can't be whipped, you can't be defeated until you have accepted defeat in your own mind. Just remember that. And remember that the, no matter what the nature of your adversity is, there is always that seed of an equivalent benefit if you will concentrate on the circumstance and look for the good that came out of it instead of the bad. Don't spend any time brooding over the things that are lost or gone or the mistakes that you have made. Don't accept, put in some time analyzing them and uh, learning, profiting by them so that you won't make the same mistake twice. And thus it will be seen that controlled attention involves the blending and the application of many of the other principles of the philosophy. Persistence should be the watchword behind all of these principles. Controlled attention is the twin brother of definiteness of purpose. Just think what you could do with those two principles. Definiteness of purpose, knowing exactly what you want, and concentrate everything you've got on the carrying out of that purpose. Do you know what would happen to your mind, to your brain, and to your whole uh, personality, and to yourself, if you would concentrate on one definite thing? And by concentrating on it, I mean the... Put all of uh, the time that you can possibly spare when you're not sleeping and not working to earn a all of the time that you can possibly spare seeing yourself in position of the thing that represents your definiteness of purpose. Seeing yourself in position of it, seeing yourself building plans for attaining it, working out the first step that you can take and then the second and then the third and so on, concentrating on it day in and day out. In a little while you'll get to the point at which Every way you turn, you'll find there's something in the way of an opportunity that'll lead you a little bit closer to the thing that uh, represents your definiteness of purpose. When you know what you want, it's astounding how many things you'll find uh, that are re related to exactly what you want. I was living in Florida some years ago, and <clears throat> I had a very important letter coming to the Tampa, Florida post office. I knew the letter came because I'd talked on the long distance to the, city, the National City Bank in New York and I knew that letter was in the mail and was out down at the post office. I had to have it before 12 o'clock. I called the postmaster who was a friend of mine and he said the, the mail for your, I lived out in the country 10 miles off. He said that mail is somewhere between here and, uh, and Temple Terrace. It's out on the route number one and uh, I don't know of any way for you to get that letter before 12 o'clock except to run the postman down. And he said, I'll tell you which station is where to start because he's already passed station number nine, I think it was. He says, you pick him up there and uh, I'll give you the instructions how to follow his route. Well, route number uh, one came over the same highway at long distance that I used in traveling from Tampa out to Tampa Terrace at my home. I traveled it every day. I didn't know there were any mailboxes on it, but when I began to, began to be important for me to observe mailboxes, I won't tell you, I never saw so many mailboxes in all my life. <laughs> Believe me, they were, looked to me like every hundred feet almost, there was a mailbox. And they were all numbered. And I was looking for the number that the postmaster had given me as the one that he'd probably, where the, he would probably be at that very hour. Well, I finally caught up with him, and he had, it was on a Monday. And he had an enormous load of mail in his wife. He said, man, I can't do anything. I can't do anything about that. I don't know where your letter is. And says, I won't know until I get rid of all. I said, listen, fellow, I have got to have that letter. It's in there. I have got to have it. I said, the postmaster told me to run you down and not to take no for an answer to tell you to get out and sort that mail and let me have that letter. Now, I, that's what he told me. And if you don't think so, come right over here to this farmhouse and you can call him. Well, he said, uh, it's, uh, not, it's unlawful. I can't do that. Well, I said, unlawful or not, I've got to have that letter. Now, that's all there is to it. Now, listen, fellow, be a, be a good sport. I know you and me are arguing. You've got a job to do, and I've got a job to do. Mine's important, too, and yours is important. And it's not going to hurt you very much to move that mail. You can do it in a little while. Oh, hell, he said, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so he went to work, and this, the third letter that he picked out was mine. Third one, he didn't... 
just one of those things, you know, when you know what you want, uh, somehow or other, and you're determined to get it, it's not near as difficult to get it as you thought it was. I've often thought of that experience, how uh, indicative that is of, of the experiences of people who uh, know what they want and are successful in getting it. They don't let anything stop them at all. In opposition, why, they just don't pay any attention to opposition. I've often watched Mr. Stone, my distinguished business associate, Mr. Stone, and his uh, talk to his salesman. Well, I tell you, I get a thrill every time I hear him speak. Because that man doesn't, end, I don't believe he knows what the word no means. I think he's long since for, believes it means it yes. <laughs> well, that's right, then the results he gets show that he means it, uh, believes it means yes. He can be the most definite about the things he wants of anybody I've ever known, and the most definite in uh, failure and refusal to accept uh, a turn down. <laughs> in other words, when objects get in his way, he just goes right over them, or around them, or he blows them out of the way. But he never lets them stop him. Now that's concentration. That's uh, definiteness of purpose, put into action. Take Henry Ford, for instance. And everybody knows what his de obsessional definite purpose was. Everybody knows it. Most people have been riding a part of his major purpose around uh, every day of their lives. Right? Driving it. It was a low price, dependable automobile, wasn't it? He didn't allow anybody to talk in. There were promoters that go... I, I have heard <coughs> promoters pro approach Mr. Ford with uh, opportunities that seemed to me most glittering. And his... Uh, his reply always was that he was engaged in the thing that consumed all of his time and all of his effort. He was not interested in anything outside of his definite major purpose, which was to make and distribute all over the world low-priced, dependable automobiles. And, of course, uh, that uh, sticking to that uh, job made him fabulously rich. There were hundreds of people that I saw come into the field and uh, spend more money infinitely more money than Mr. Ford had to start out with and they went back into the graveyard of failure and I couldn't uh, find a dozen people in the world today who would know what their names were. Men who were better educated than Mr. Ford, better uh, personalities, had everything that he had and a lot more except one thing. They didn't stick to the last. They didn't stick to the one definiteness of purpose the way that he did when the going was hard. Mr. Edison in the field of invention, there was a marvelous illustration of what concentration could do. And if you want the truth, I'll tell you that if Mr. Edison was a genius in any sense, it was because when the going was hard, then was when he turned on the most steam and didn't quit. Think of a man standing by and keeping on through 10,000 different failures as he did when he's working on the incandescent electric lamp. 10,000. Can you imagine yourself going through 10,000 failures in the same field without uh, wondering if you shouldn't have your head examined? I was so astounded when I heard about that. I saw his, his log books. There were two stacks out of them, that high. Each book about 250 pages in, and on every page there was a different plan that he had tried and it had failed. And I said, Mr. Edison, suppose that you hadn't found the answer. What would you be doing right now? He said, I would be in my laboratory working instead of out here fooling away my time with you. <laughs> and I will say, in his behalf, he grinned when he said it, but believe you me, he meant just exactly what he was saying. You know, infinite intelligence will throw itself on your side when it finds out that you're not going to quit until it does. If you do not give up when the going is hard, infinite intelligence will throw itself on your side. Remember, that's when the going is hard. It, you see there, you have your faith tested, you have your uh, initiative tested, you have your uh, uh, enthusiasm tested, you have your endurance tested, and when nature finds out that you can stand the test and that you're not going to take no for an answer, she says, all right, you pass, come on in, you're over, you're in. I think that nature or infinite intelligence or God or whatever you choose to call it, I think that uh, first cause likes to convey information to people in simple terms and things they can understand. And surely this philosophy comes within that category. 
It wouldn't send the high school boy or girl to the dictionary or to the encyclopedia. You can read it or you can hear about it, you can understand it, and your own intelligence tells you the moment you uh, come across one of these principles that it's bound to be sound. You just know that it is. You don't need any proof. You can see that it is. And it wouldn't have been in existence today if I hadn't concentrated to 20 odd years of adversity and defeat. So you see it does pay to concentrate and it does, uh, my own experience corroborates what I said, that if you stand by when the going is hard and fail to quit, infinite intelligence will throw itself on your side. Now I don't think that would be true in a case uh, like that of Hitler's. No doubt he had uh, a definiteness of purpose. No doubt he had an obsessional desire. But what was wrong with his uh, definiteness of purpose? That is right. It ran counter to the plans of infinite intelligence, to the laws of nature, to the laws of right and wrong. And you may be sure that whatever you're doing will come to naught or come to failure and you'll come to grief if it works on hardship or an injustice upon a single individual. What you must do, what you do, if you hope to have infinite intelligence throw itself on your side, is to be right. And you can only be right when everything that you do benefits everybody whom it affects, including yourself. Well, then take uh, Christ's uh, whole life was devoted uh, to concentration upon developing a system of... Uh, living for the brotherhood of man. Now, he didn't fare too well while he lived, but on the other hand, uh, he must have been doing the right thing because what he was doing, even though after he passed on, he only had 12 people to start out with. And that's uh, why I believe that what he was doing, what he was preaching, must have been right because if it hadn't been right, it would have been destroyed and gone along before this. Because there is something in nature, or in infinite intelligence, which uh, brings forth with every evil the virus of its own destruction. And that, uh, there's no exception to that. Every evil, everything that's not in conjunction with the overall plan of nature, of the natural laws of the universe, brings with the circumstance itself the virus of its own destruction. Take the William Wrigley, for instance. Mr. Wrigley, by the way, William Wrigley Jr., was the first man that ever paid me money for teaching him this philosophy. I, my first hundred dollars that I ever made was, came from William Wrigley, the stenographer's friend. <laughs> well, just think what that man did on a five-cent package of chewing gum. I never ride down Michigan Boulevard. I never see that building down there lighted on the river lighted at night, that white building, and I don't think of what concentration can do even in connection with such a thing as a package of, five cent package of chewing gum. The signers of the Declaration of Independence and George Washington's and Abraham Lincoln's and Thomas Jefferson's concentration was to give personal liberties to all of the American people and eventually to the people of the world. It may well be that the freedom of mankind, the, this is the cradle for the birth of the of the freedom of mankind itself, because I know of no other nation on the face of this earth that is concentrating upon the freedom of the individual as we are doing here in the United States. And I know of no other philosophy, no other people engaged in any other study whose objective is to free so many people as those who are studying this philosophy. Well, we're on a marvelous lesson tonight, the subject of accurate thinking. You know, the thing that everybody talks about and hardly anybody ever does. <laughs> Accurate thinking. Uh, what a marvelous thing it is to be able to analyze facts, think accurately, make decisions based upon uh, accurate thinking rather than upon emotional feelings. The majority of opinions of uh, decisions that you make, and I and everybody else for that matter, are based upon... Uh, things that we desire or things that we feel, not upon the facts necessarily at all. And when it comes to a showdown between your emotional feelings, the things you feel like doing, and the things that your head tells you you ought to do, uh, which one do you think wins the most? Feeling. What's the matter with the head? That it doesn't get a better chance, do you suppose? Why isn't it consulted more? 
Very good, very good. The sparks are flying. I can see that. Someone has said that most people do not think, they just think that they think. And I think that just about covers it. Now, there are certain simple uh, rules and regulations that you can apply, and this lesson covers every one of them, that will uh, help you avoid the mistakes, the common mistakes of inaccurate thinking, that is, of snap judgments and of being pushed around by your emotions. You know, the truth of the matter is that your emotions are, are not uh, reliable at all. You take the emotion of love, for instance. It's the greatest and uh, grandest of all of the emotions, and yet the most dangerous for, by the same token. And uh, perhaps more uh, trouble, more difficulty in human relationship grows out of uh, uh, misunderstanding of the emotion of love and for all other sources combined. Well, let's begin at the beginning on accurate thinking and see just what it is. First of all, there are two kinds of uh, thinking based upon two, uh, three, uh, on three major fundamentals as follows. Inductive reasoning based on assumption of unknown facts or hypotheses. Then there's deductive reasoning based on known facts or what is believed to be known facts. Then there's logic. That is, guidance by past experience similar to those under consideration. Now, those are the three types of thinking that we do. And uh, which one do you say that we put into operation most? Inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning or deductive reasoning or logic? Do you think, it, do you think we... <laughs> I don't <laughs> Now, inductive reasoning is based on assumption of unknown facts or hypotheses. You just assume, you don't know the facts, but you assume that they exist and uh, you create them and uh, base your judgment on what you have created. Now, when you do that, uh, you must keep your fingers crossed and be ready to change your, uh, your decision readily because your uh, reasoning may not uh, prove to be accurate because you're, uh, you're basing it upon assumed facts. But deductive reasoning is based on known facts or what is believed to be known facts. Now that's where you have all of the facts before you and you can deduce from those facts certain things that you ought to do to your, for your benefit or to carry out your desires. And that is the, uh, that's supposed to be the type of reasoning or thinking that the majority of people engage in, only they don't do a very good job of it. Now there are two major steps in accurate thinking and they are first of all separate facts from fiction or hearsay evidence. That's the first step. Before you do any thinking at all, you must find out whether you're dealing with facts or fiction, real evidence or hearsay evidence. And if you're dealing with fiction or hearsay evidence, it behooves you to be exceptionally careful to keep an open mind and not to reach a final decision until you have examined those facts very carefully. And second, separate facts, separate facts into two classes. Important and unimportant. Now, what is an important fact? You will be surprised when I tell you that the vast majority of facts that we deal with, I'm talking about facts now, not hearsay evidence, not hypotheses, the vast number of facts that the majority of us deal with day in, day out are relatively unimportant. Why? Well, let's see what an important fact is and then you'll know why. An important fact may be assumed to be any fact that can be used to advantage in the attainment of one's major purpose or any subordinate desire leading toward the attainment of one's major purpose. Now that's what an important fact is. And I, uh, I wouldn't guess, I wouldn't miss, uh, miss it very much, I suspect, if I said that the vast majority of people spend more time on irrelevant facts that have nothing whatsoever to do with their advancement than they do on facts that would be of benefit to them. Curiosity people, people that meddle in other people's affairs, gossipers and all that sort of thing, putting in a lot of time thinking and talking and about other people's affairs, dealing with the petty uh, small talk and petty facts, in other words, dealing with unimportant facts. If you doubt that uh, what I've just said is true, Take inventory of uh, the facts that you deal with for one, for one whole day and just sum up at the end of the day and see how many import, really important facts you've been dealing with. It'd be uh, better to do this on a Sunday on an off day when you're away from your occupation or any business. 
because that's where, um, where an idle mind usually goes to work on unimportant facts. Now, um, opinions are usually without value because they are based on bias, prejudice, intolerance, guesswork, or hearsay evidence. It's surprising to uh, take inventory and find out how many people have how many opinions on how many things that have no basis whatsoever, except the way they feel or what somebody said to them or what newspaper they read or what influence they've come under. Most of our opinions come as a result of influences that uh, we don't have any control over. Uh, free advice uh, volunteered by friends and acquaintances is usually not worthy of consideration. Why? Not based upon facts and too much small talk mixed up in it. That last part of the sentence there is uh, not meant to be funny. Free advice volunteered by friends and acquaintances is usually not worthy of consideration. What kind of advice is the most desirable advice when you need advice? How do you go about getting it and what kind of advice would you uh, recommend? Someone who is a specialist, who's known to be an, a specialist in connection with the problem at hand and go and pay him for his services. Don't go after any f for free advice. And speaking of free advice, I just want to tell you what happened to a student of mine, a friend of mine first, and then a student out in California. For three years, he used to come over to my house every weekend and spend three or four hours, for which I ordinarily would get $50 an hour, but I didn't get anything from him because he's a friend and acquaintance. <laughs> so he'd come over there to get three or four hours of free counsel, and, uh, well, I gave it to him. I gave it to him every time he came, but he didn't hear a single word that I said. Not a word. That went on for three years. And finally he came over, finally he came over one afternoon and I said, now look here, Elmer, I have been giving you free counsel for three years and you haven't heard a darn thing, only darn's not the word I use, now, the, nor, you haven't heard a darn thing that I've been saying, now you'll never get any value out of this uh, counsel that I'm giving until you start paying for it, now why don't you just go ahead, we're starting a master course right away, why don't you go ahead and join that course like everybody else and then you commence getting some value. He took out his checkbook and gave me a check for the master course and entered the course and went through it. And I want to tell you that his business affairs began to thrive from that moment on. I had, ne I had never seen a man grow and develop so fast. After he paid a substantial sum for some counsel, he commenced listening to it and putting it into action. <laughs> and that's human nature I'm talking about. I'm telling you it is for a fact. <laughs> free advice, you know, it's just about worth what it costs. Everything in this world is worth just about what it costs. <coughs> love and friendship, what are, what are love and friendship worth? A lot. Do they have any price? No. Well, now you try and get love and friendship without uh, paying the price and see how far you go. Those are two things that you can only get by giving them. You can only get the real McCoy by giving the real McCoy. That's the only way you can get them. And if you try to mooch, get to friendship and love without giving it in return, uh, you, your source of supply will soon play out. Accurate thinkers permit no one to do their thinking for them. Now, uh, what do you think about that? <laughs> How many people are there that permit to circumstances and influences and radio and television and newspapers and other people and relatives to do the thinking for them? How many do you think, what percentage would you say of the people Nine, permit that? 97, 99, and somebody said 100. <laughs> well, it's not quite that bad. <laughs> not quite. But I want to tell you the percentage is way up there. No fooling. Allowing other people to do the thinking for them. <laughs> if I have one asset that I feel proudest of, and I do, I have one that I feel really proud of, and uh, I bet you'd never guess what it is. Think for yourself. Think for yourself. <laughs> well, now, what is it? I have an asset. I have an asset that I'm very proud of. It has nothing to do with money, nor bank accounts, nor bonds, nor stocks, nor anything of that kind. It's something more precious than that. I have learned to hear all evidence, get all of the facts I can from all of the sources, and then put them together in my own way and have the last word in making my own thinking. That doesn't mean that I'm a know-it-all. 
or that I am a doubting Thomas, or that I don't seek counsel. I certainly do seek counsel. But when I have gotten that counsel, I determine how much of it I will accept and how much of it I will reject. Certainly, when I make a decision, nobody could ever say that it isn't the decision of Napoleon Hill, albeit it might be a, a decision based upon a mistake. It might be an error. It's still mine. I did it, and nobody influenced me. That doesn't mean that I'm hard-hearted, that I have no, uh, my friends have no influence on me. They do. Certainly they do. But I determine how much influence they have on me and how, what reaction I will have to their influence. Certainly I would never permit a friend to have such influence on me as to cause me to damage some other person just because that friend wanted it done. And that's been tried many times. I would never permit that. Doing your own thinking, well, I want to tell you that uh, I think the angels in heaven cry out when they discover a man that, that, or a woman that does his or her own thinking and doesn't allow the relatives and friends and enemies and other people to discourage the business of accurate thinking. Uh, the reason I'm emphasizing this, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is because the majority of people never do take possession of their own minds, the most valuable asset that anybody has, the only thing that the Creator gave you that you have complete control over, and the one thing that you generally don't ever discover and use, but you allow other people to kick it around like a football. I'm not talking to you, but you understand that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about they. <laughs> that is, they who are not here in this class. <laughs> 